Hi, this is Henri from Diginomica. This is a first on a few different levels. I think this is my fourth NRF show, but this is the first time I've ever done an on-site podcast review, so that's a first for me. Also, this is the first I've ever done a podcast with someone that I've just met. <laughs> so I've got, I got uh, Joachim with me. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. With 3Kit. Thank you. I'm which is your new evil plans venture, which we're going to talk about in a few Absolutely. minutes. Um, but the reason that I cornered you for this is because I was talking with your uh, your smart PR people, and they presented you and your partner uh, as p- vintage retail people who have been around the industry for a long time. And so you've been walking the floors for a couple of days, along with thousands of other <laughs> NRF folks trying to make sense of it all. And so we're gonna we're gonna talk about what you're seeing and what you're what you learned from the show, and just kind of your takes on all the sexy technology that we're seeing and what it really means. And then we're going to talk about 3Kit and why you guys launched the venture. And for our listeners, there is some background noise because at NRF there is no privacy whatsoever. Uh, so we found the quietest place we could. And if it remains kind of loud in the background, that will probably mean that we'll wrap up a little sooner. So, you know, as soon as we started recording, it got really loud. So that's how it goes sometimes. So anyhow, uh, with that in mind... Um, what do you, what do you what are your impressions of this year's show so far? We're, we're at the end of day two, right? It's been a, a great show for us so far. I think we've been uh, surprised by the number of people who came by our booth. We're in the innovation lab uh, upstairs, yeah. uh, which is a great forum. Uh, I had one lady on the on the first day say, "You know, I really like the innovation lab the best because it's a great mix of I'm seeing new things that are coming." At the same time, it's not really totally small companies who just launched. There are yeah. companies who have customers, initial customers, who are doing kind of interesting things. They're somehow selected by NRF, and so you have to go through a process. And so we've been very fortunate to be in the Innovation Lab, and it's been playing out great for us because people who came were genuinely interested in seeing like what's going on, what's new, what can we learn from other people who are in that space. And so it's been you know, a great number of people who came by. Traffic has been very consistent. And I think we've been also surprised how much international audience we have seen. So uh, we had, I think, originally expected to see more U.S.-based companies, but we've seen a ton from Europe, uh, South America, as well as Asia. Yeah, I was in the innovation lab for a couple of hours, and I couldn't see nearly everything. But um, I, I saw some pretty interesting stuff. I saw, um, I did a facial recognition demo, which I wrote about today, uh, which was pretty creepy, weird, interesting. Um, it, it's an opt-in scenario, but it was still, um, you know, pretty pretty uh, po- potent experience to, to, to see my face and see that technology and see it estimate my my age and my mm-hmm. gender and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, there's like some robotics demos in there, which are cool. There's one um, where they scan your body, um, yeah. you know, and they can actually measure all of your measurements, which is obviously interesting. I think as we will talk about everything around e-commerce, how is the buying experience changing? And I think that's one of the, the basics of having kind of the measurements of somebody to, especially in the apparel industry, to see like what can I yeah. sell to them. We're coming from a different angle. I'm sure we're going to cover it, but yeah. uh, that is kind of an interesting trend that we're seeing, kind of like how we measure and how we all prepare for a more digital age. Yeah, there was also a, an Alexa-like animated digital assistant. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe her name was something like Millie. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I did a session with her. Mm-hmm. She was like um, helping you to try on sunglasses. Okay. Uh, and telling you, and she recognized like a thousand different gestures. Right. Uh, so you found the right sunglasses? Yeah. Well, that remains to be seen. <laughs> I think she thought that the black ones worked better than the red. But anyway, I did a video on that, so maybe I'll be hopefully releasing that. But you know, it's always funny to interact with a digital assistant, especially one where they try to give her personality. Um, but the personality, like you, you could, the personality was kind of like spunky and, mm-hmm. and fun, but you could also sort of disrupt the personality if mm-hmm. you ask the wrong questions. Then so it's weird. It's like, <laughs> you're kind of talking with this like girl with attitude who's helping you try on sunglasses, but then you can break it pretty quickly okay, as yeah, well yeah. still. So that's kind of interesting mm-hmm. as far as like how, how well would that really work at this point? Right. You know, it's kind of interesting. It, it's really different than like asking Alexa for your weather forecast where it's a pretty straightforward type of interaction. Whereas trying on sunglasses or whatever, it's like how, but, but anyway, I, I like this spirit behind it. I'm just not sure the tech is 
quite there, there yet. yet. Yeah. So what what kinds of we'll get to your company, but what kinds of overall trends and questions do you think retail customers are dealing with right now? What are the issues they're preoccupied with? I think we're going to get into kind of our speciality, which is around yeah. kind of like the the product experience. I think. What we're seeing a lot is companies coming and looking for personalization in all kinds of aspects. So to see how can I make the buying experience more personal to the individual consumer. So I think whether that be, you know, uh, understanding what the purchasing history of somebody is and recommending kind of like the future, uh, whether it's like in our, uh, our environment, how can I make this whole buying experience in terms of the product better and make it more compelling, more engaging, where we see everybody's thinking about how can I make sure I understand my customer to the level that I can personalize the experience so I can give them a better service, a better product. I think that's kind of like a very high level as we're seeing in different shades, but I think that's kind of like one of the consistencies that we're seeing across the people that, that came to our booth. Yeah, I think the the thing that I think was really interesting is that I have I have been a little bit resistant towards personalization because I've found so many times that when people, when, when companies attempt to personalize experiences for me, it falls short so many times. I, I think part of the tension there is that a lot of times companies are still content to go fishing. So, for example, mm-hmm. hotel chains are a great example. Like, I'm a freaking business traveler. I don't travel for recreation ever. Uh, hotels that I frequent should know that by now, mm-hmm. but they still send me promotional packages. Mm-hmm. And why, so why would they do that? Well, I mean, it, it's faux personalization because they send me from a hotel that I did stay at, but they don't take it into account. Oh, why, so why would they do that? Why would they ruin my perception of their, well, the reason they do is because it's cheap mm-hmm. um, and they feel they have nothing to lose. They're like, well, we'll send it to more people. And so a certain percentage will respond. And the problem that I have with that is that, well, how, how are you ever going to convince me that you're, so, so I've been very skeptical about personalization, but what I, and, and the other thing I'm really skeptical, skeptical about is I think that it breaks down so quickly. In other words, like, in, in one context, you might get a pretty good personalized experience in one situation, but then, you know, uh, it, it's just like with anything else. It's like, Amazon to me is a good example because great frictionless purchasing, fine. Um, have fun with their call center if you have a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so e- even Amazon gets exposed. But but what I've been more and more persuaded by is that in a more confined context, personalization does drive revenues. Mm-hmm. Um, I was talking with a Salesforce team today, and they told me that um, in their commerce cloud for the holiday shopping season, their customers using the commerce cloud, they could attribute 26% of revenues to AI powered stuff. Mm -hmm. And most of that, as far as I can tell, is some form of personalized, uh, you know, semi-automated personalization, semi-intelligent. We can debate how intelligent it is at the moment. But so, so, and that's just one example of stats that I continue to see. And not just stats, but customers. Like I've talked with a number of customers who can speak to definitive results that they're getting around, you know, a more confined approach to personalization to tackle certain types of, uh, you know, projects. And so I'm kind of persuaded by it. Like, I think there's, there's actually something going on there. Whereas you can throw something else against the wall, like voice commerce and say, well, it's not there yet. (laughs) And And I think, you know, it's something that I, I would argue it's a recurring theme I've seen in business that very often, you know, the, what you read in the media, what you're hearing, what we're talking about and personalization is a great example is I think thinking wise in our heads, we are much further ahead than what reality really looks like. Right. And so I think I've seen it very often in my business experience where we would be talking about high level things in terms of like pricing strategies, for example. But when you then go to a customer, I remember many years ago, I went to a big corporate giant and we're talking about like, what is the best pricing strategy for them? It turned out they didn't have prices for some of their products. Mm. I'm like, well, why don't you have prices? They're like, well, they typically the AEs come up with those prices and they find a way to do this. It's like, you're a corporate giant, you know, like you're on the NASDAQ, you're everywhere. How come you're going to have prices for some of your products? So I think, you know, some of those ambitions, I think we're always thinking like, yes, and AR is another great example in this. Everybody loves the AR story. 
but we're falling short not on the AR, we're falling short on the very basic product data that companies mm. do not have. And it's right. much more simple. I think the problems we're facing are much more simple. It's not the last integration in a- a- AR and the latest kit on the Apple iPhone. It's more like the very fundamentals that we don't have. So in your yeah. example of the of the hotel chains, they might just not have the data or they have it siloed in different databases. Right. And where I think conceptually everybody agrees that's what you should have. But in reality, I think it's it's not there yet. So I think in that sense, I think also what I see is like personalization is an ambition, is a goal where we're going towards, but it's mm. a long path until we are there. And so I think we're seeing it from the same perspective. I think we're seeing customers who want to mass customize certain products and they right. just see a great markup that they can put on a product just because it's customized to a, pro- to a specific customer and yeah. therefore being able to charge more. Yeah, that's really interesting. I I had a conversation at a prior show with a company and he was talking about his um, service bots because one area where bots are getting a lot of action is around, you know, first line customer mm-hmm. service, right? So if I have more simple customer service mm-hmm. queries, a bot can theoretically yeah. handle yeah. handle that, and provide me with proper information and, and I'm good. Right. Um, and so I was really pressing him on the, I was pressing him on the limitations of, of the bot and what the bot could do. Um, because my experience is that they get in over their heads pretty quickly. Mm. But his point was, he said, my bot's fine. My bot's as smart as your data mm. is. He said, if, if you can't give me deep documentation and data on your products and procedures, then my bot's going to be really dumb. And I think it was a really great example of this, of how the plumbing behind this stuff is so important. And that's where a lot of the challenges come in, right? Because you can only personalize to the extent, like, the more data silos you have, the more fragmented that is going to become, right? right? Yeah, absolutely. So. I think that's all we're seeing also on the visualization side, which is kind of what ThreeKit is about, where, yes, we can visualize a lot of things, and it's amazing what you can do, but very often customers struggle. They don't even have the CAD, the CAD models, for their products available because mm-hmm. they've always been manufacturing them on some... Uh, piece of document that's been around for the last 50 years. And so I think it's it's very hands-on practical problems that sometimes keeping us from achieving kind of the big visions. Right. So data silos are, are remain a problem. And then there's also that question of the proliferation of, of data and taking proper actions with that data. Um, and one, one really interesting demo, sort of not demo, but presentation I went to was with Chick-fil-A. And I went there because they're a Tableau customer. And mm-hmm. I uh, spent a fair amount of time looking at Tableau in the analytics area. Mm-hmm. And th- they were really interesting because they were talking about how, you know, so data-driven so business or, or using data to improve your business is not no longer the purview necessarily of Google mm-hmm. and Facebook and so mm-hmm. on. They, they were saying, like, what you know, we can do it too. Like, and we're a, you know, what do they call it? It's not quite fast food, but, like, mm-hmm. the new category that mm-hmm. they're in, like mm-hmm. um, quality fast food or whatever. Right. And they're like, we can we can do that too. And they they went into some examples of it. But one of the really interesting things that came in there was just they they acknowledge that there's a transition you have to make where where you know making good actionable decisions around your data. Just because you kind of open up the mm-hmm. floodgates and let that data flow doesn't mean that that's translating. And so I think to me that's the other fundamental issue here because all of the new tech that you see, whether you want to talk about IoT devices or New form. It, it's all generating this massive sort of data exhaust, right? And so, to to truly like advance your business, you're going to need to know what to do with that. Correct. Absolutely. So that's the other big thing that I was yeah. seeing at the show. So you know, I think that's it's a very valid point. And so I think you know, these are all kind of like great goals that we're going towards, and we're gathering yeah. a lot of data for it, but we don't have the right you know, focus on it. And very often it's a question of like, do I invest money in this? And these are not shiny objects, right? These are not sexy things. That's not what you sell easy to the board. Let's, yeah. let's look at our data. But I think uh, we hope, and we've seen this also in the past, once there are projects to do things, then they will yeah. also lead to cleaning up some of those, you know, breaking down the silos and doing those things. But that's right. what you should really start with. That should be the homework for, for yeah. many companies. Yeah, great. So with... Uh, let, let's talk a bit about your your startup three kit because you guys have been in stealth mode for a while and now you're ready to talk about what you're up to. Um, but the thing that I found sort of interesting as we talked about it before we started taping was that you know you guys are basically self funded. 
so you have you have some runway based on your own investment. Um, but kind of putting your money down like that means that you you're serious about this. This is a big leap that you're taking. So tell us what you're doing and, and why you decided to take this leap right now. I think we're very enthusiastic and optimistic about that segment, about mm. the opportunity that the segment presents. Um, and it is a number of reasons why it is. But ultimately, when you look at uh, the, the customer cases that we have seen, uh, together with kind of the founder of the company. The company has been around, Tweakit has been around for five years. Um, and so I think when you look at the customers like Crate and Barrel, like Steelcase, Herman Miller, and a few others, then you see the company generates real business value. So it's real money on the table that companies can save and can make more money. And I think that's the one that convinced that this is a real business. This is not a startup in the sense of let's try out something, but there's real business value in it. And there's a couple of examples. So what 3Kit does, it, it has an online platform for visualization solutions. So it helps you and companies to create their product models in a digital format and then publish them or deliver them in different formats, whether it's an image, whether it is a 3D configurator, whether it's an augmented reality um, application. So it can do different things. It basically helps companies to produce a better product experience, a more engaging product experience. So you do not only have a 2D, boring 2D image on your website that never changes whatever mm. you do, but you have a configurator where you can customize the product to what you want it to do, the color you want it. You have an AR solution where you can take an iPhone and look in your living room and place your furniture right. right there where you want it. You can size it. You can yeah. change it. So I think it's a more engaging experience. Yeah. And so, but when you look at this, it's all great. You know, technology looks cool. You know, it's like, well, all geeks in a way, it's like cool to see kind of augmented reality and walk around it and see like how does a piece of furniture now look. But then when you look at kind of like what are the actual business benefits of this? What is it that customers get out of it? I think one of the things we're seeing with customers is that they are able to increase their conversion. When they're selling online, when they're selling in stores, they have a more engaging experience with the customer. The customer sees what it is actually that they are getting tailored to their requirements. Mm. So it's not a static image. It changes. It's a different color. It's a different size. It maybe has, you know, in apparel, it might have personalization and might have monograms on it for them. And right. so it gives them additional benefit, increases conversion. It also mm. gives you the opportunity to charge more. If you have the monogram on there, if you have a Rolex watch and on the back of it you can engrave your name and see how it looks like or change the materials of the, mm. of the watch, that allows you to charge more for it. So I think there is a conversion uh, opportunity, there is an upsell opportunity in there. Mm. And then there's also, in a very realistic way, a big cost, cost savings opportunity because we've seen from a number of companies what they're doing is they, today they have to go out and go into a photo studio and take real pictures with a photographer for their products. Now, if you have a product that has a lot of permutations, and some of those have millions and billions of permutations, then you cannot take pictures for all of those. So you have to trim it down and say, I'm going to go and take those 100 permutations of my, let's say, suit I'm, I have on. Uh, but that's a problem because these might be the ones that the customers don't want to see or they might not be able to customize them. Now, in a virtual model where you set up your suit in a virtual model, then you can have any of those billions of combinations. You can produce them. You can show them. Mm. And so you have pictures for all of them. And so right. Great and Barrel is, is a good example where they're using us to create pictures, 2D, photorealistic pictures that they put into their catalog. So similar to what IKEA is doing, I think IKEA's catalog only, almost only it consists of um, digital images, so virtual photography. They don't set up anything in the studio anymore. They all generate it on the computer. I think a number of customers do this as well because it's just a lot cheaper to do it. And you can do it very quickly. You can change one color, whereas otherwise you would have to re rearrange the whole mm. setup of, of the setting. So coming back to the original question, I think we see a lot of opportunity in that market mm. where there's real business benefit for the end consumer and therefore also our customers. And with that, I think we were con convinced that there is an opportunity that is so interesting that we had to invest in, that we're all willing mm. to put our money down and to uh, to go in it and uh, run with it. Yeah, absolutely. 
So, so you don't really see something like this in the market now. I have seen some augmented reality shopping stuff, mm -hmm. but you, you really haven't seen anything that does exactly what you do. I think what we've seen is we've seen point solutions. So there's somebody mm -hmm. doing AR. There's somebody doing web configurators. There's mm -hmm. somebody doing virtual photography. Right. I think what we haven't seen is everybody having that on the same platform. Mm -hmm. And we think kind of longer term what's going to happen is that we will have more and more companies, especially the ones, the manufacturers, maybe also the retailers, who want to maintain their own products and their pictures going forward. Mm. I think today what we're seeing kind of our main competition, if you want, are agencies, are consulting companies who mm. create those one-off AR solutions, those one-off configurators, those one-off you know, product shoots. Right. And then if they want to change something and product, portfolios, you know, change quite a bit these days, then the customer or the company has to go back to the agency and say, hey, I need a new photo shoot or I need a change in my configurator. Right. And I think our fundamental belief is that over the longer term, those companies want to do this themselves. And our platform enables them to make those changes themselves rather than to mm. go back to an agency. Yeah. There were, uh, there were two things that stood out to me from uh, from when you and I were talking about this prior, which was um, the that there's an impact that can be had from self-service, that not just providing this for customers, but providing them an ability to self-serve going forward made a lot of sense to me. And the other piece was the platform piece as opposed to one-offs, because that's, that's the real danger that I see right now um, in the retail environment. Um, I was actually talking with Oracle about this uh, yesterday because they were talking about how uh, 80% of their net new customers are, are going directly to cloud for, for, for mm -hmm. their retail functionality. And the big reason for that is because these customers know that putting AI stuff aside and all that, they know that they're going to get a lot more feature updates mm -hmm. with, with regularity and ease if they're in the cloud. So the question then becomes, well, what about all the legacy customers that are legacy not meaning as an insult, mm -hmm. but just that they're on older on-premise releases? Mm -hmm. He said, well, also 80% 80, 80 of those are moving to the cloud when they have like a major reason to do a systems upgrade, which happens every three, five, seven years. But, but then the question becomes, well, what if, what if you're a large organization, but you're not ready to do a systems overhaul to, to brand spanking new tech in your industry? Like, what if, for whatever reason, your your budget constraints and your architectural contracts, you're just not ready to do that? How do you get started? And and what I see a lot of times is you start with one really cool project, mm -hmm. but you don't think about the implications of that going forward, right? So you start with a cool, you build a cool mobile app, right, for for customer orders, or you know, you build it for your suppliers to check inventory level, but it's just the one app, and and that's great, but you didn't really think about where it, what happens when you have 50 of those, you know, and, and I apply that to your example as well, right? What happens when you're running 50 different catalogs and you have an AR thing going over here and you have a pricing configuration thing going on over here? Shouldn't that all be on the same platform? To me, that that's big because then you can start stacking those smaller wins, if you will, together. I mean, is that kind of part of what you're thinking about? Is that I think How it's something, your platform can work? Or? Yeah, I think it's something where we want to get to in a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we see it as much today. We're too small yeah. for that yet. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it, what's interesting, what you're saying, is that I think when we look at our customer base and our prospects, I think we see two different types of scenarios where companies come to us. The one is the expert comes to us. So somebody who is doing kind of visualization for the company. Right. And they might be exactly the one you're describing that has a number of different tools from Autodesk, from Adobe, yeah, yeah, from yeah. everybody, but they don't find exactly the functionality that they need that we right. provide in that case, or others might provide in other cases, whereas the 3Kit platform allows them to bundle some of those. This is right. one scenario of, of prospects of interest. We see another one that's interesting where it comes, which is obviously also very interesting for 3Kit, they come more from the board level because they are under pressure to do something. Very often, we see mm -hmm. that with on-site uh, on or brick-and-mortar stores who are suddenly feeling the pressure from online retailers right. or online businesses, and they're saying, we're in trouble. We need to do something. Mm -hmm. And so I think they are looking for ways how can we at least catch up to them, maybe even leapfrog them, 
but do something in this battle. Yeah. And so I think that's a totally different dynamic, obviously. There it's more like right. we need to find a solution, and visualization is often kind of one of the ways they want to differentiate because yeah. they're lagging behind. There's right. a nice shiny object on, on somebody else's website, and it's looking cool. Mm. It's a young company. It's all about e-commerce, mm. and it's all easy to use, etc. and they're losing customers, and suddenly they're like have this oh my God, something is happening and now they're wanting to do something. I think that's the second interesting left. Two yeah, very yeah. different user groups or, or interests or prospects, but these are the two we're and seeing And you want right to serve now. both of them. Yeah. We do, yeah. yeah. Obviously, you would always want to be more aligned to the board uh, level because board that's level. where, where the decisions <laughs> are made. Uh, but uh, I think we see both. So it's a top-down and bottom-up approach. Mm. And I think we hope that as we are kind of make more efforts in that market, also educate the market of what's available, I think we'll see both coming together. Right. So it's a practical retail startup, but an ambitious one. Absolutely. So, I mean, uh, we're putting $10 million into it, so we definitely yeah. want to get a huge return out of it. Yeah. One of, my, one of my kind of calling cards is like, practical is sexy and sexy is practical. <laughs> yes. So that's kind of what you guys are trying to prove. It is, but we'll I think, see. it's to my earlier point, I think, we're selling a lot of sexy with like augmented reality. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. But a lot of the business comes from those photorealistic images. Sure. The, the configurators. Yes, right. everybody wants to go to AR, but do we all have the data for AR? Do we have the models for AR? You right. know, once you've built this, you have the option of going it. And I think that's why 3Kit is it's such an interesting approach because you're not doing a piecemeal process project for just AR, you're putting right. it on the platform and then you can choose which one of those you want to output. And that kind of ties into what I was saying a few minutes ago where you might start with a certain project but right. you're laying the groundwork for other projects on the same platform. It is in a way, it's kind of future proving you yeah. for other things that are coming in visual and so yeah. whether you want to export it here or there, the 3 platform allows you to do a lot of those yeah. things. Cool. Well, a lot of companies that started in the innovation lab area have gone on to success on the show floor itself so perhaps in a, in a year or two we will see you there we um, will for sure i think we have a yeah. meeting tomorrow to look at kind of space for next year so there so you go we will for sure be back i, I nice. mean ideally we would want to be back in the innovation lab because we love it yeah uh, but uh, i think in reality you can only be there for one year as i know right. as a founder. Now you have to graduate yeah so we will definitely come back i think it's yeah. been a great experience for us so um we're, we're definitely looking forward all to right that. we need to wrap up quickly I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thank you, Rajan. Bye. <laughs> That's funny. I, I was totally ready to stop anyhow, so I think we reached a good. Right. This is just in time.